Hi, everyone. We're back, this time with a summer bonus episode. This week, our guest, Salva Dutt, spoke with us all the way from the world's youngest country, South Sudan, so we apologize for any technical problems caused by the distance. And when I drilled that well, uh, a lot of things happened. Uh, you see a school is getting built and uh, market is coming in. Girls that we used to walk miles and miles collecting water all day long, they don't have to do that anymore. They have opportunity to go to school. And their life changed and their community thrive and clinic come in and other things happen around them. That tells me a great message that, yes, I should do more. This week, Patrick sat down with Salva, a former Sudanese refugee who now runs a nonprofit called Water for South Sudan. His organization builds wells and increases access to water and sanitation in South Sudan. Salva is the protagonist of the book, A Long Walk to Water, which was published in 2010. The book was a number one New York Times bestseller and it was written by the Newbery award-winning author, Linda Sue Park. The book details Salva's experiences as a quote-unquote lost boy. The Lost Boys were the name given to a group of Sudanese refugee children, mainly teenage boys, who fled Sudan during its civil war to avoid becoming child soldiers. Salva was among the group of about 3,800 Lost Boys who were brought to the U.S. in the 1990s. These children captivated U.S. media attention, and they are now one of the most famous refugee groups in recent history. Salva spent time in refugee camps in Ethiopia and Kenya before being resettled to the United States in 1996, walking for over a year to get from Ethiopia to Kenya. You're listening to Seeking Refuge. Your host for this week is Patrick Anderson. So Salva, I became familiar with you after reading A Long Walk to Water. The story was incredibly moving. After that, I then did further research and found your nonprofit organization, Water for South Sudan, which specializes in building uh, wells for uh, your country, South Sudan. It is an honor to be able to speak with you today. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to talk to you. So the first question I have is going back to your childhood. What was Sudan like while you were growing up? Uh, Sudan was totally different from where you grew up in the U.S. Uh, let's say in my childhood, when I was growing up, I didn't have enough things. Like, for example, let's say I didn't have enough toys. I, have to ma- I didn't have toys. I have, we have to make our own toys by modeling the clay and find whatever we can play with. I didn't grow up having enough, enough clothes, and uh, I didn't have electricity in my house. I didn't have running water. I didn't uh, eat three times a day like what you guys have in the U.S. Uh, the life was very simple, and uh, we just have to make everything ourselves right there. And uh, I used to take care of cows and goats, and the life was very simple. Salvo went on to say how his childhood shaped him. He and his siblings lived a practical life, and even as young children worked and did what they could to support their family. The rest of the village included many members of his extended family, so his community was strong and close. The community helped to raise him as well, and this sense of togetherness has built a strong foundation that Salva has based his identity off of. Now, take me back to the day that your village was attacked. What emotions were you feeling? What was happening? Uh, Anything that stands out to you? Of course, when the attack came around 10, uh, 10 a.m., was kind of like uh, uh, panicking, is chaos. You are dreadfully fe- fearful full, uh, with that situation. At that moment, I was just like, how to escape out from that situation first? And after that, I did escape, uh, not hearing any gunfire. I want to see my family right away. I want to be with them. And, uh, but I have no opportunity to see them, was very challenging and scary moment at that time. After that day, your life completely changed. Can you describe what it was like being a refugee after that, not having a home? 
Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, before I become a refugee, it took me two months walking to, the, to Ethiopia to where I became a refugee. And that long walking from there to Ethiopia was very, very, very challenging. A lot of things happened. I lost my uncle on the way. I lost my close friend. And uh, yes, it was very dramatic at that time. And when I reached to uh, Ethiopia, I was taken to the orphanage camp because when you are a young person, then they take you to where the minors, those who don't have relatives, been put. And I end up there. Salva told me that living in a refugee camp was difficult. He had no independence and likened his experience to being in a jail. Salva could not leave the refugee camp or else he would never be allowed back in. Along with that, the camp suffered from a severe lack of supplies, especially in food, water, sanitation, and medical shortages. The difficult part was like, uh, when will you get out in that camp to go and be with your family and have a normal life? That thing was that agony was always haunting me all the time. When will I go home and be with my family? And that was what the life was like in refugee camp. But some, but it was good because at least the, the UN was bringing food for us to survive. But the rest were not that great. I asked him what the refugee camp workers were like and how he handled leaving the refugee camp in Ethiopia. Salva said for the two years that he lived in the Ethiopian camp, he never formed a friendship or bond with any of the refugee camp workers. When the Ethiopian government violently forced them out of the camp, Salva took charge of 1,500 other lost boys and led them across hundreds of miles of desert and war-torn areas to a refugee camp in Kenya. He broke down his group into smaller subdivisions and walked for over 18 months and across three countries before finally reaching the Kakuma refugee camp in northern Kenya. So with such a high concentration of boys, can you kind of explain what was going on in Sudan, why there were so many boys who were in these refugee camps? There are a lot of circumstances in that area. Uh, let's say the war was still going on in, in Sudan, and many people were fleeing, and a lot of adult men, they were going to fight, and then there was... Well, they call them now, we used to call them Ralin, and now they call them Jinjaweed. Those people, uh, they were Muslim, Arab, and not, they just come to the village and terrorize people like really, really bad. And whoever man they find, young, uh, young boys, oh, this, you will be a victim right away. And then the whole thing was, the whole country was a mess. And, uh, and then a lot of people were just fleeing and when you are fleeing in the area that you don't have close relative with you, then you run by yourself. Like what happened to me running by myself because I was not with my parents and end up now in refugee camp. And the war was still going on in, uh, in Sudan and a lot of people were fleeing. But it was not just us alone, that boys who were in that refugee camp. There's other two families, husband and wife, and girls and they, and uh, couples, they were there too in that camp. And let's say the camp that we were in, we were the, all the refugees, there were like 40,000, and we were only 17,000 uh, boys. And the rest were all sort of people uh, going on. But those who didn't have relatives, that's where you end up in that orphanage camp. When you were originally in the refugee camp in Ethiopia, eventually you're forced to leave. What, what was that like having been right. there for so long and then being forcibly removed? Uh, it was uh, terrifying, uh, this uh, how to put, it, to put it. Because at that time when uh, the whole chaotic happened around 10 a.m., I was just thinking that, okay, after school, I would be able to go back home, but now, that day it went a different wrong way. And uh, 
being in refugee camp and that yes, I find myself in refugee camp that I was not intended to be. And what made it worse too, because there was no any communication whatsoever back home. That at that time there was no telephone, there was no mail system, there was nothing. And it made things difficult too. And there was no address that you can go and trace your family. And my family, what happened to them, they didn't go to another refugee camp. They would run to the safety place in the swampy area that they were in. And then they were just there. And now I have no ways to communicate with them. But I think I want to go home and be with my family. When you left and started leading all of these boys uh, to Kenya, what were you experiencing uh, with all of these people looking to you and with such incredible hardship at uh, still a young age? Uh, especially what happened when you are in the action, you don't really think about uh, what is going on. You just think about what could you do at this moment to be able to survive. That's all. And uh, we didn't put any much thought of it. It's just like we get up in the morning and organize ourselves and making sure that everyone is safe, we, no one is sick, and then we keep walking and where can we go and rest? How far do we need to walk? Who is sick? Where could we get food? Where can we can get water? That's all. And then after you accomplish all this, you walk the distance, you just make a parade again to make sure that you check on each other and tell them what you need to do. How long are we going to rest? And when will we start walking tomorrow? All those kind of things. And then check on each other. This is the only thing we used to do. Nothing else. It's just how could we survive? And how could we push that day, today, to the next step? When you got to the refugee camp in Kenya, were there any differences between that camp and the one in Ethiopia? There was no much different, actually. The only difference is that I get opportunity in Kenya to go to U.S. That's the only difference. But the rest were all the same. It's just like U.N. agency feeding you and that's it. So let's talk about when you found out that you were going to America. What emotions were you feeling uh, having that opportunity to go, but yet still knowing that your family was going to still be in Sudan? was mixed emotions because, uh, first of all, you hear about great America. But if you go to America, would you stay in refugee camp again or would you be free? And if you go to America, would you be able to get back and be able to find your family? All those kind of emotions were just running in my head and didn't know what really, but I accept uh, whatever come across to me and there were a lot of emotion there going on without knowing uh, by the way at that time they tried to prepare us with orientation to show us how america is like they in that orientation they just say okay some people might end up in the cold weather where the snow is and we didn't know what it meant by snow we thought that it was just something hazy or foggy and that's it it was not that cold and uh, they will say, uh, if you get lost, make sure you call 911. And 911 was the only thing that clicked in our head because we said, okay, if we get lost, you call 911. And I remember after we closed the class of, uh, of orientation, everyone just find giggling. We just say, hey, if you get lost in America, what would you do? You just say, call 911. <laughs> so when you got to America, how did you handle cultural differences as well as the uh, linguistic differences in that pretty much everyone only speaks English? Oh, uh, yeah. There was a lot of challenges that was happening with the cultural. First of all, let's say cultural shock. And when you're in that situation, you have to do the best you could because that country, will, you will not change that country to act in your culture. You have to make sure you fit yourself in that culture to survive. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, there were a lot of things going on. Let's say Americans used to talk faster, could not catch up. I didn't know English very well. And uh, let's say when I see the white faces, sometimes they look the same. I could not recognize you again tomorrow. 
uh, the girls looked the same, guys looked the same, it was a big challenge. But what could I do? I have to do the best we could, uh, I could to make sure I fit it. Fortunately, luckily, there are a lot of generous people in America who really step up to help us to be who we are today. First of all, we were put in the welfare because we didn't have job or thing like that. And then to get money from the welfare, which is all American money, and then our sponsors stepping in to help us find a job. Let's say my family, uh, if you had that a long walk to water, more family, they were always helping us to do all the things that we need to do. And imagine for someone like me who grew up in a place that has no running water, has no electricity, has no microwave, has no refrigerator, have no shower, knob, warm water, hot water, oven, all those kind of things were challenging. Or going to the market and pick up all the food that you need was very challenging. We couldn't do it alone without people that would step up to help us find a job and making sure we go to school and learn and be someone uh, like us today. Did this challenge of living in America, did that influence who you are today at all? Of course, of course. It did influence me a lot because uh, I appreciate Americans so much. I would say that that's, America is my endowment. American shaped me to be who am I today to be able to help other people. Because I went to America, and I become free. I was not sitting in a refugee camp again. They helped me to go to college with their scholarship. They pay me. They helped me to survive. Uh, they, yeah, they helped me with everything that I need to be someone who am I today. And yes, American culture and American people make me to be who am I today. And I'm really proud of America. And, I, and I'm very proud for what they give me to be someone today. Now you then went to college in America. What was that like not having English as your native language? Uh, what I did before I went to college, I went to ESL, English as a second language, to make sure that I understand English because I was growing up, I couldn't go to high school anymore. And, uh, and that what helped me when I went to college, at least somehow I couldn't hear as much as I could, but even though I didn't catch everything, but at least it shaped me to be, to fit in. I, I read that uh, you also got a degree in international <laughs> business. That's, uh, that's currently what I'm trying to get as well. Oh, that's great. When Salva's village was attacked, he was only 11 years old, and he fled from his school without his father or any members of his family. I asked Salva about finding his father after Salva was resettled in the United States. Salva told me that he hadn't seen or heard from his father for over a decade. Throughout his journey as a lost boy and living in refugee camps, he had no idea if his father was alive. Against all odds, Salva discovered that his father was alive, but gravely sick because of unclean water, and he was staying in a medical camp in Sudan. Salva then relied on his American friends to help him fly back to Sudan to be reunited with his father. I saw him who was just sitting in that compound that he was staying at because he walked 300 miles away from my village to where the clinic is in Sudan at that time. And when I went to that compound, I find him who was just sitting and I walked to him directly. And I said, hey, dad, how are you? And he was, he didn't recognize me because I was now a grown up man. And he said, who are, who are you? And then I said myself, and he became so emotional and he took some water, poured them in my head. A symbol of coming back from whatever death or tomb. And he was very emotional. And uh, when I was there, I find out that he was sick because he was drinking bad water. And uh, and I said, well, I should do something. So would you say at, at that point is when your organization, Water for South Sudan, uh, was kind of born in your head? 
Absolutely. Uh, after that, I found out that he was sick because of waterborne diseases. I said, I should do something to help, uh, to help him and other people that would need help. When Salvo returned to the United States, he was determined to solve this problem of unclean water in South Sudan. With the help of his friends from St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Rochester, New York, Salva started the nonprofit organization Water for South Sudan in order to dig wells for South Sudanese villages. It took him over two years to finally raise enough funds, but eventually he was able to fly to South Sudan and begin his work saving lives. And when I drilled that well, what happened was just something that I was not imagining. Uh, a lot of things happen. Uh, you see school is getting built and uh, market is coming in. Girls that we used to walk miles and miles collecting water all day long, they don't have to do that anymore. They have opportunity to go to school. And their life change and their community thrive and clinic come in and other things happen around them. That's tell me a great message that, yes, I should do more. And that's why you see Waterfall South Sudan went on and on and on because of the resolve, the impact that we had because the little thing opened the other doors. Salva told me that South Sudan severely lacks in infrastructure. There are not roads that can easily transport supplies. There are no rest stops for food or housing. There are no mechanics to call if a vehicle or piece of equipment breaks down. When you go to build a well in South Sudan, you must bring all of your supplies in from outside of the country. And once you are within the young nation, you must be entirely self-reliant. Another aspect that makes working and traveling in South Sudan difficult is the extreme heat that is prevalent every single day. And after you are really appreciated is after you drill it, but you see people drilling it, drinking water in it, and then go somewhere, and then next year when you come back and pass by and see the changes that happen around the world, this is the time that you really appreciate it. So it's clear that wells are integral to building these communities throughout South Sudan. Do you plan on continuing to build more? Of course, we are planning to continue to build more because the demand is still uh, that high. And especially with this uh, coronavirus, the demand is extremely high because you don't need people to, to gather around the well together because they will uh, get, get that disease easily. And you know, coronavirus now, the only treatment for it is the water. Water becomes so essential right now because you need to wash your hand, making sure you clean all the time. Water for South Sudan hasn't built a well in every village yet. It is still an ongoing mission. Water for South Sudan not only builds wells, but also creates sanitation stations for villages. The outbreak of the coronavirus has only increased the need and urgency for more wells and sanitation stations to be built in order to provide water and proper medical care for those who are afflicted by the virus. And uh, like, let's say, for example, the communities that we are working with, they are illiterate community. They are not uh, educated. And they don't have other ways to learn how to take care of themselves. They don't have television. They don't have telephone that they can uh, check, they can uh, read. And they don't have radios that they can hear what the COVID-19, what the coronavirus means. They don't have that. It's a water for South Sudan people. We have to go using a microphone sitting on the truck and explain the whole thing. Salva has also expanded the role of Water for South Sudan due to the coronavirus. They now try to spread awareness of COVID-19, as well as teach people effective ways to prevent the spread of disease through water sanitation and social distancing. Salva also remarked on the lack of major hospitals within South Sudan, thus making prevention all the more important. So what would you like people to know about the current state of South Sudan and the people who live there? Uh, what I want people really to know is about the world has become one village now. Let's take this uh, coronavirus. It happened in China. 
and within a second, all oh, is all over as human being. That means we are one people that are connected. And the South Sudan is a, a youngest nation in the world that has nothing, zero, as I mentioned before. We don't have masses here. We have to export them somewhere. If we could, and they are not even enough. We don't have a manufacturer of making soap here locally. We don't have globs here. That means this country is still fragile, completely. And whatever going on in the, the world, not, I want to tell people not to forget about their younger baby, South Sudan, who is the youngest country in the world now. And I'm sure people are always there watching out. Like all the funding that we get, they come from other countries, like in US. And we, are, we become now born one people, especially this coronavirus put us as one human being completely because we are facing the same thing and no country is out of that. We are all together. I then asked Salva, how should we view refugees, not just from Sudan, but from all over the world? He says, a refugee is someone who has had to flee their home nation because something went wrong. They are not bad people. Refugees are resilient and have seen incredible hardship. They are capable people who need to be supported. Like, let's say, for example, I myself, I was a refugee. I didn't have any hope completely that when I was in the camp that I will never become educated. I will never do anything for myself. I will never meet my people again. But because the U.S. pitch in and take me there and give me opportunity to become educated, that's why I'm able now to come back home and help other people. Salva points out that refugees are people who have witnessed how their own countries went down a path that led to violence. So they are the people most equipped and most motivated to make sure that it never happens again elsewhere. Refugees know how to make the world safer for future generations. I asked Salva if he supports third countries taking in refugees like the U.S. took him in? Of course, of course, of course. Because if you are sitting in a refugee camp and now your home has been destroyed completely, if you send back to your home where you have nothing, you're still going to have a hardship because you never gain anything in a refugee camp. Like, for example, now we have internal fight, civil war in South Sudan before. And we have a lot of refugees, uh, they call them IDPs, internal displaced people within the country. And now because of coronavirus, they have to go back home because sitting in that camp is dangerous for them. And when they go back home, they get zero. Salva stated that there are still refugees sitting in camps in other nations. For developed countries to take these refugees in, it gives them hope. These refugees are still people. Other countries should give them a chance to establish themselves. Those are the people that when they go back home someday, they will help their politics within their country and say that if we keep killing each other, fighting, destroying ourselves, it's not helping us. For our people to go and sit in the camp, it's not helping us. And it's good for these people to be taken in by the big countries to make sure these people benefit in their system and they would bring that system back to their country. Salva said that when developed nations support refugees, they give refugees the tools to improve conditions within their home country. Other lost boys like him have returned to South Sudan and have become advocates for change and have supported South Sudan through various social work. If it is safe to do so, these refugees can return to their home country to heal it and fix what problems forced them to leave in the first place. Salva also mentioned that he wished that IDPs had support to lean on as they returned to the homes that they fled in in order to rebuild their lives. For our listeners who might not know, IDPs are internally displaced persons, meaning they were forced to flee their homes and went to another part of the country. Basically, they are refugees who never crossed an international border. Salva also had a message for the international community about how they should try to alleviate the situations that refugees face. 
which can often feel hopeless due to the way the international system currently works. There are people, refugees that are sitting somewhere, like let's say now we have a lot of people, refugees pouring to Europe right now, and a lot of them are dying on their way. We should be the one, we are this country, they should do a good system, how you can help these people to get them there or to set up a good system that they would not feel like refugees that are doing something for themselves. Because some people are very hopeless if they go back to the country that they, they run away, the country that has been destroyed, where would they go to? And when you see them, they are really trying hard even to throw themselves in that water is because they have nothing else. They have no way out. And that's why they are choosing the path that either they die or they go to Europe. And the world should really come up with something really positive to make sure that we help these people nicely not to throw themselves in this water when they just go and sing and lose their hope completely. No. And the, uh, this advice that I said, the country should take in people. And it's not the first time countries were taking in the people before. Why not now? How can people help South Sudan and specifically your organization, Water for South Sudan, uh, people who are living in America or Europe? There are so many ways someone would help. Just the word of mouth to support, to tell other people to know about Water for South Sudan the good thing that they are doing to the people of South Sudan. That's another great help. Uh, with ever advice that someone could contribute at all this kind of thing, that's another great help. Like now, maybe, maybe you are aware about the Iron Giraffe Challenge. Some of the school get in there on the website, they find that and then they compete there. And uh, you can go on and uh, a school could participate if they raise $1,000 they would be put in the drawing. If that drawing happened, if they get lucky, then they win me or they win my Skype with them. If they win me, then I go to the school and then talk to them. All those are things. But I really don't know what to say. It's just what for us Sudan is doing a great job so far with all this current coronavirus and uh, to make sure that we are teaching awareness and teaching hygiene to make sure at least we are not going to prevent everything. At least we do something. That's the only thing I will say. And uh, people can go on, on the website and see what, they, what we are doing, what are the good things we are doing there. And finally, looking forward into the distant future, maybe 10, 20, 30 years, what do you hope to see in South Sudan? Where do you want to see progress? I really like to see that the insecurity is settled completely and the people are thriving and the development is happening, happening full scale. And everyone is healthy, not getting contaminated water anymore. We would be having good hospital, good clean water, good school, good food, and making sure people are not illiterate anymore and uh, let them develop themselves. That's what I want to see 20 to 30 years. Well, thank you, Salva. It's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to be able to interview you. We at Seeking Refuge are extremely appreciative of you taking the time out of your day to conduct this interview with us. Oh, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to Seeking Refuge. If you liked this episode, be sure to rate us and comment below and let us know how we're doing. We will be back with more content soon, so be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you consume podcasts so you don't miss a thing. In the meantime, go back and listen to our previous episodes to hear some extraordinary stories. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Refuge Podcast. As always, if you have a story you'd like to share with us or an idea for a future episode, email us at seekingrefugepodcast at gmail.com. If you're interested in following Salva's story or getting involved, be sure to check out Water for South Sudan's website. The link is in our show notes. The fundraising challenge for schools that Salva mentioned is their Iron Giraffe Challenge, and the registration deadline for this school year is February 26, 2021. A long walk to water can be purchased at most major booksellers. We encourage you to buy local. That's all for now. 
Thanks to Maxi International House, as always, for making this show possible, and to Salva for speaking with us. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in the next one.